Hi, Ryan. Hi, Rachel. How are you doing? Good. I have oh, some fresh oranges this morning. Oh, man. Oranges. We're already kicking it off with the orange talk. We would make Sheridan proud, we would. How are you feeling overall, though? We're back in the world of Babylon 5 to talk about it. But how are you feeling? I already miss Sinclair. You already miss Sinclair? I you- already miss Sinclair. <laughs> you, are like, you- for the first freaking shot of this episode because it opens up with, with Sheridan. Sheridan at like his voice first and hey, then it's him, me Sheridan and I'm like I want Sinclair like yeah. I know that I'll like you again but I want my Sinclair back are you that picture of the animated series Wolverine fondly stroking that picture and but the picture is of Jeffrey Sinclair is that you right now Because that's me. I'm doing actually very well. I'm feeling refreshed. I'm feeling rejuvenated and calm. I'm very glad that we took a little bit of a break before jumping straight into season two because I really appreciated watching this episode on its own merits. I do obviously have some things lingering from having just watched the first season and covering it, but spending a couple of weeks away and just sitting down and watching this uh, one I felt great because it was that sensation of when you do start, start something new, you're you're meeting it on its own terms in a, in a in a minor way, and so that is how I'm doing. Of course, where Ryan and Rachel, this is our show, Yum Yum podcast, a show in which we talk about episode by episode a television series. We used to talk about Star Trek Discovery. We're currently talking about Babylon 5. We come at these from a rewatch perspective, which does mean we are a heavy spoiler-based podcast. So if you have not watched the given material and uh, when it comes to B5, we're talking about the, the entire thing, not just this particular episode, you are going to be bound to be spoiled. We heartily recommend that you watch this series. We both enjoy it very much. You have been warned. We are called Yum Yum Podcast because of what reason? Wait, Rachel, what reason? The turd that is Star Trek Discovery. I thought you were going to say the term from Star Trek Discovery, <laughs> but no, no, the turd that is Star Trek the Discovery. The turd that is Star Trek Discovery. Shout out the line. I would say yum. birthed. Maybe it's the poo that you have when you're giving birth. Why did you even bother asking me to do this bit if you clearly want to do it? No, 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 because you know what's fun? I love the line and you hate the line. (laughs) This is a line from Star Trek Discovery, yum, yum, in which a character says that phrase out of nowhere, Rachel, out of completely nowhere. In response to murder. In response to murder, you love it. And I hate it. See, now we've flipped the script around. See, every episode, you and I change on these type of things. You used to be anti-YYE, which is Yum Yum Energy, which is the next question. Who in this episode had Yum Yum Energy? The energy of somebody who would say Yum Yum. And I'm going to ask the second question. You know, often we merge these two together, but I'm going to separate this now. Who would have said Yum Yum in this episode? So... Who has YYE and who actually would have said yum yum? Warren Keffer. For both? Yeah. Interesting. I think think I'm going to go with that. I I feel like um, any member of the Trigati could have also uh, also bring some YYE and could have said yum yum. But who's your pick? Well, I actually have uh, a pick for each. So I agree that Warren Keffer would have said yum yum, especially during that final scene with him in it, where he's at the uh, their fancy new restaurant bar hangout. Offices lounge or Air something? hearts, it's called. Uh, I think he would have said yum yum. But I have a random person. They don't have a name. But they sure left an impression of having YYE, which is a, you know, a way of saying what the fuck energy. There's this one actress 
that has to deliver simply a line of dialogue during Sheridan's speech. He interrupts I, it. I know the exact moment. Cause I, I don't know what the fuck she was going for in that I, line delivery. I don't delivery. know either. But Nobody it, does. To me, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly YYE. No, no, it, it had... Was, it, like, like, YYE, to me, needs to bring a level of sexiness and oh, sultriness. Now you agree to that. Again, flipping the script, you were anti-sexiness in this. To me, she may not have had the sexy quality, but she sure did fuck with me because I thought that was a really well-acted scene. And then she came along to deliver some lines to really remind us that not every cast member in Babylon 5 is at the same level as our leads. I'm sorry to bother you, sir, but I've got security on the link. They've got him in Bari demanding to speak to you. He won't say what it's about, only that it involves the safety of the station. He says it's absolutely urgent. Points of departure. New station chief, Captain John Sheridan, is tested by a warship leader, Richard Grove, who wants to goad him into initiating a battle so that Minbari forces can justify a counterattack on Babylon 5. That is pretty accurate. It's not so crazy, this one, but don't worry, the craziness of the DVD descriptions will be in full force as we go along with uh, this season, because I've read a couple of them ahead and... uh, Oh boy. Rachel, tell me your history and relationship with this particular episode. I wasn't ready to watch this episode when, like, our first watch through, like, my first watch through together, I was just like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to say goodbye to season one. I'm not ready to say goodbye to Sinclair because you warned me. He's I not knew- on the cover of the DVD either. I knew that it was coming, uh, like, you'd done your best to try and prepare me, and I didn't want to start. I didn't want to start. But also you did. I was like, I need more Babylon 5, but I don't want this new guy. And then I was just like, okay, okay, you are very clearly your own character, Mm -hmm. because I was worried that it was just going to feel like they're just put a different actor and made a new character that was basically going to be the The same. same. Or direct recast, perhaps, even. Yeah. Well, I knew that it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. You you told me that, like, the new Captain Sheridan comes along and he he sticks around. You reassured me that it wasn't a rotating captain's chair. Unlike a certain modern Star Trek show that we won't name directly Will we now? But yeah, we have no rotating captain's chair for no. this particular... We will have another captain of yeah. B5, unfortunately. We'll get there. We'll get there, yeah. Lockley. Won't we, Lockley? I know you're new here and all, and uh, I just wanted to say... You're okay in my book, ma'am. We all know if we've listened to the podcast before, and if not, welcome to our show... I was raised with season one in isolation. I had it on DVD for like four years because of the distribution that was happening in Australia, especially in my small rural town of in Australia. I was not able to instantly get the second season. And this was a time before we could all just download everything or stream it. And it was a time in which you had to wait for the physical media to come out. And so I had to wait for season two. The build up to it was very strong. And I did not really know what to expect from season two and this particular episode. I knew that Sinclair was gone. I knew that Tron was in. I like Tron, uh, the film, uh, to minor extent. I like Bruce Boxlight now as an actor. So I did feel as if we were going to be in somewhat safe hands, but... Whereas I still have never watched Tron. Uh, or Tron Legacy. Uh, but I was, uh, I was so happy when my mother came home with that DVD. It was blue. The other one was red. It made me excited to know what the other colors would be for the DVDs to come. And she came also home this with one it. Was like the thinner set. Oh, it was uh, yeah. My first season one is a box set. Then the other ones, all the other ones are just the normal thin DVD cases, which annoys me so much. I'm just so aggravated by that. But 
I was so happy to get that DVD in my hands, open it up, see all of the images on the physical discs, as well as the artwork and images on the case itself, the 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 booklet booklet. with the upside down Minbari cruiser on it, which upset me greatly. And then I didn't even think when I put the DVD in about what the DVD menu was going to be like. The DVD menu is really different. It has this anim- it has the animation of this shooting ship and all of this stuff and the weird fucking morphs. The weird morphing they effects stick. on the DVD menu. Oh, they, they stick, stick with you. They stick with you. They haunt you. They haunt you very much. Seeing Talia morph into Kosh is one of the scariest fucking things I've ever seen in my life. But <laughs> the absolute joy that I felt is almost unparalleled because it was a turning point in my adolescence. I finally got to be able to see this thing. I was just starting high school. It was a a big time of change and the show reflected that. This episode is about change. It's about transition. It's about new beginnings and it really helped me in that moment in my life. I was really happy. Of course, I was happy just to be able to watch more than season one. I was just happy to see new adventures with these characters I like. Avonova seeing her having to grapple with being in charge and uh, to know that Franklin is still about being the doctor of the show and his concerns about everything. And although we didn't get any of the proper alien ambassadors in this episode, we know that they're going to be there, of course. But yeah, I was absolutely elated. I uh, did have some niggling concerns and I still have some over the years. But overall, I was blown away with the fact that the presentation had stepped up its game in both the physical media release, but also the actual show. The lighting was a lot uh, better for me. The music was a bit more noticeable. The acting... Uh, very impressive. The writing on point. It was everything I wanted and more. I was not let down by this season premiere when I finally put it in that DVD player. I had a lot of build up, and it could have been a big disappointment. Imagine it, Rachel. You're sitting with this season for four years and you aren't allowed to see the rest of it because of the constraints of capitalism, but you finally get it, and it actually manages to strive to be the thing that you wanted it to be. How impressive is that? Like, how rare is that? We live in an age in which, you know, some of these movies that we watch, we have to wait years on end for them to come out, and Sometimes they manage to be better than the last one or improve upon, but a lot of the time we're met with the disappointment of time and expectation. For this, at the time when it aired, it aired like a week after the uh, finale of season one. So people didn't really have that uh, that long-term wait that we are familiar with with other TV shows. People have often talked about Star Trek The Next Generation with the best of both worlds cliffhanger. Of course, you and I were too young to experience uh, the anticipation of that, but this was my version of that, where I had to wait years to find out what happened to the land, what is going to be the explanation for why Sinclair leaves, and all of these other things. So... I am very happy to be able to discuss this now, having watched Babylon 5 many a times, watched it many a times with you, to be able to actually sit down and tell people about that. Because not everyone has that experience, of course. Rarely do people have it. That is my journey with Babylon 5. It is a strange one, but it is one that has happened. And it 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 is a, it, it is a major factor to my enjoyment of B5. Hmm. the inability to watch it all in one go. Because you got to watch it all in pretty much one go. You didn't have to wait that long for episodes. And people who are binging the show now or watching it on streaming services, they have it more readily available. But for people back in the day, they had to watch it week to week and then wait for the new seasons. For people like me, we had to wait for the DVD releases. And the ongoing story and the patience that the show is demanding of you, the viewer, is thoroughly earned. And for you, Rachel, you got to rush through it and you got to see the the 
the setups and payoffs in quick succession. But for people like me, we had to wait a long time for those. And And I appreciate that so much, not just because I am an impatient person, but I am a forgetful person. (laughs) And I, I, I like, I really like and appreciate that I didn't have to wait years and be like, wait, that. What was that? That 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 links to a thing. I'm going to trust that that links to a thing because I feel like it links to a thing. Yeah, it's a show that demands a lot of its viewers and that is something to behold. General, with all due respect, what do you mean you're reassigning Commander Sinclair? Reassigning him where? To the Mimbari homeworld. He'll be functioning as the first Earth ambassador allowed permanent residence there. The big thing to talk about with... This is Sinclair. He's no longer in the series. You and I both knew this. I know that not everybody knows this when they go into B5, uh, but most people that I know did have some prior knowledge before watching the series uh, that he is not in it all the way through. That mainly comes down to promotional. You look it up on IMDb, they've got Sheridan listed in more episodes. But I think it's wise that we start to talk about what happened to Michael O'Hare. We've touched upon it in previous episodes, but uh, what happened is Michael O'Hare was uh, suffering some major mental health uh, issues and stuff in his life, and it was affecting his ability to be the uh, lead actor in this show. He was having a series of psychotic breaks, paranoid delusions. Uh, I can't remember if he was ever, if there was ever fully mentioned if he was clinically diagnosed, but it seems uh, from JMS's uh, recountings of this that he had schizophrenia of some sort. And yeah. He had to leave the show. Uh, It was a thing discussed between him and JMS. It was kept a secret to uh, keep his career alive, but also for the the reason for the departure. The reason, but yes, the reason for the departure was kept uh, a private, and his mental health problems were kept private for the sake of keeping his career alive, but also just the general stigma involved. I would imagine as well. Uh, And we, the audience, did not know. Why Sinclair? Why why Michael O'Hare left? Yeah, this there only was, came out after O'Hare after he had passed, passed away, which was twenty twelve. Uh, a little while after that, we found out, but he left, and we, the audience, did not know why. When you first watched this, you watched it when we still didn't know why, uh, and it was always a point of contention. Why did he leave? I think that. No, I think that it was when it had just come out. So when you found out that Michael O'Hare w- had been suffering like that, and that is the reason for why he had to step aside from this, how did you feel? And how does it make you feel about watching this particular episode in which this episode is, for a large portion of it, saying... Sher- uh, that Sheridan's now here and Sinclair is gone. How did that all yeah. impact you? Like, on the first watch, when I was, uh, like, becoming aware of it, I think that there was a level of ignorance for me about, like, what that condition really meant. Yeah. Um. So I was just like, but couldn't he have just done it? And now, like, obviously I understand more and I'm like, no, no, like not, especially after listening to the JMS book and getting a better understanding of what O'Hare's experiences were, it was, it was, seems like it was very much the right and the best decision for everybody involved for him to walk away. But I'm still sad that he doesn't get to be here and it always it always takes me a while to warm up to Sheridan each yeah. rewatch i'm just like but i want sinclair yeah and it's it's not just because sinclair is what i'm used to i really really like the way that sinclair gets to be a leader a part of 
the stuff here with the Sinclair Sheridan cross, uh, the transition is it's clunky and inelegant because they couldn't do it with Michael O'Hare. He just couldn't film these scenes. You couldn't write him a whole episode. And maybe also from a, a production and writing standpoint, it's just easier to start the new season with your new character to get everyone on board for this new character rather than spending the episode saying goodbye to the previous one. That is we- something, too, when it comes to creation. It is more effective to do that. But we understand logistically the reasons why you couldn't have Michael O'Hare to film these things. But yeah. from a basic viewer perspective, new and old, rewatching or first time, it is mm-hmm. very awkward yeah. that he is just gone and they never treat, like they do talk about him, but they treat it in this but, way of, that's over there yeah. now, we're on the Sheridan train. Okay, everybody on the Sheridan train, chug, 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 choo, choo, choo. It's hands fucking down this introduction and trying to like you know oh. acknowledge it the way that they do it hands fucking down a thousand million times better mm-hmm. than what is done in another show do you want to take a guess at- oh I thought you were going to say in this show with Lockley and Ivanova <laughs> No, I wasn't even going to go there. No, no. Matt Smith to Capaldi <laughs> in Doctor Who. Well, that's a different beast it's entirely. It's a different be- No, but like the transition very easily could have been done like that. A, a scene done mm. being like, hey, it's okay. I'm oh. moving on to good things. Like, it's yeah. okay for you to like the new guy. <laughs> yeah, if Michael O'Hare phoned in to tell us, the audience, that it's okay to yeah. like the new guy. No, no, that would have been clunky as well. If, but, but like, you get, um, like, Ivanova gets a message from Sinclair being like, hey, I'm off to Minma, but Hello, Hello, old friend. <laughs> when I found out about O'Hare... Uh, it broke my heart. Of course it did. It's a very sad story. And also, uh, it's a very motivating story as well, though. It's good to know that our lead actors, these actors, these people that we look at via our their- people. That we look at through their characters, we're reminded that they're humans. They're regular people. Mm-hmm. They suffer things. They have tragedies in their lives. They have issues that they have to go through. It humanized him because for a very long time, he was just Sinclair. I didn't know Michael O'Hare, didn't know him from anything else. He was just that character. It reminded me that these actors are people, not their characters, which was, I definitely needed that kick up the butt at that time for for Sinclair because I had a very uh, rough go of it with um, him leaving the series because we didn't know why. For the longest time, we didn't know why. And you start to draw your own conclusions as to why, based on why other shows and other productions do these things. When I found out why he left, I felt like a fool. I felt bad. I felt guilty because... For a period of time, I had assumed in my brain that he left because he didn't want to be in the show anymore. He left because he didn't like it, or he didn't want to be here, or he thought he was better than this material, or he got a better job elsewhere, because other productions, I've seen that happen. Yeah. I felt so bad because of that. And then also, another thing I felt bad about was I had the flip side, where I got angry at JMS, or angry at the producers, or that, because I also thought, for a large period of time, they got rid of Michael O'Hare to replace him with Bruce Boxleitner, the more famous actor, the more bankable star, the handsome guy who could get into the action scenes and the romance scenes, and everything like that, because I've seen that done in TV as well. And to know the real truth of it, it makes me have an egg on my face when it comes to that because I thought so uh, cynically and so harshly and so negatively based on just general assumptions with no real evidence to back it up. Just that basic thing of TV people are scum and they yeah. probably do these things, whether it's the actor himself or the people kicking him out because they want a new actor. I was very cynical it's because you don't think that the real reason that people can leave is 
They have lives in yeah. which things happen and it stops them from being able to do the job. Yeah, I find it interesting that that you bring up those points because another one that I was like, well, what if he just couldn't hack it? Like, being a lead is a really stressful thing and it was like it, his influence and presence tapered off during the season. So I was like, well, maybe like as an actor, he was just like, nah, being a lead's not for me. I can't hack it. It's not what I want. Yeah. And I felt really guilty about having that thought because in a weird way, like he, he couldn't do it. Yeah. But I was, I thought that it was just like a failure as him as a person but it was a consequence of a health issue that he had. Because people need to know that there's a problem in their family. If, it, if, it, if this can happen to a, an actor, a star of a show, a commander of a station, it can happen to anyone, and it's not a scandalous thing. It can be dealt with. So if anything ever happens to me, I want you to be free to talk about this. Sheridan's new character, what did you think of him? When you first started this, what was your overall impressions of this performance, this character, a new commanding captain man? What did you think? I remember being like, where the fuck is this? (laughs) It opens up with all of these establishing shots of like these different consoles. And I was like, this isn't a set we've seen before. And I was like, oh, where on Babylon 5 is this? And then... Like Sheridan starts speaking and then it's, it says the name of the ship and it's like, oh, we're on another ship? Why are we on another ship? <laughs> I don't like this. I want to be on Babylon 5. I'm watching Babylon 5. I want Babylon 5. <laughs> so it immediately like got me off kilter with that. And then like I came around to it. I was just like, okay, I know that he's going to be here for a while. And I have to accept it and move on. But what did you think of his character? That was that was the whole point. Like, what do you think of Sher- what did you think of Sheridan though? When as a person, yeah, as a character, I was trying to communicate that I didn't think about him as a person. I didn't look at his traits. I was too busy being like, "You're not Sinclair." I didn't. I didn't get that on the first watch. I was just like. It's not Sinclair. So did this episode... It's not Sinclair. Why the fuck is he dreaming about oranges? So this episode failed. And fruit. So this episode failed at its goal. Its goal is to get you on board for Sheridan, and you could not get on board straight off the bat. Nah. How long did it take you, do you think? How long did it take you to be on the Sheridan bandwagon? I think it was at least three episodes. Interesting. This is where I have to come in and uh, lay my cards out on the table. I hated Sheridan. I hated him. Not because of his character, not because of the acting, but because of what I said just a moment ago. I had assumed the worst. I had seen this before. I grew up with the Eccleston era of Doctor Who in which we didn't really know why Eccleston left. We still kind of don't fully know why he left. But there was an amazing character and actor there randomly disappeared And then they're replaced with the young, handsome, pretty boy who can get into the romance plots. And I hate that. It's very cynical. I don't like that type of uh, TV thing. I don't like that. And I've seen that uh, many a times in the course of watching things. And I just assumed that. I saw, oh, he's Bruce Boxleitner, the bigger name. He's the handsome guy. They're trying to make me like him. They're doing all of these overt tricks to make me... Uh, feel something for him, and I rejected that so hard. Just like I did with David Tennant as Doctor Who. It take it took me a while to warm up to Tennant because, as a a twelve year old or a thirteen year old, I saw that and said, "Oh, they're trying to play me. They're trying to get me on board for the typical." A uh, handsome guy leading man dude with Sheridan. Oh, he's a badass. He's a star killer. 
I I thought it was so manipulative. I, I could not get on board with him for a little while either. I was very uh, against him, not because of the actual writing, not because of the actual character, but because of my perceived reason as to why this exists in the first place. Now, obviously, that has changed. I like Sheridan. I think he's very charismatic. I think Bruce Boxlight uh, does an uh, amazing job in this episode. He's a dork. He really gives you that feeling like he's a military. Military yeah. guy. He gives you a feeling that he has been in military combat situations. He lives and breathes his character, but I now not on board for Sheridan to begin with. I was very angry. I was there for everybody else, but he was a character I just could not fathom. I just didn't want to give time to. Of course, I knew I had to, his lead, and he's going to be in the show, but. It took me a little while, like you, maybe three or four episodes. I can't remember exactly when he snapped into place for me, but eventually he did. But when I was re-watching this today, I was noting down what they were doing with Sheridan. And I do think there are some blatant tricks of the trade of getting you to like him. Obviously, some blatant exposition dumps, like letting us know who his dad was and that he's a man of the world and he has these military experiences and he's star killer. But all of that fades and strips away because of Box Lightner's performance. As I say, he it lives. Blends. He, he blends lives this it. character. He <laughs> is this character. He lives and breathes it. He is so natural. He instantly has chemistry with everybody. Everybody. He's walking up to them and he has instant he tries chemistry. tries to have chemistry with the cocoon. Yeah, he even tries to fuck the cocoon. Yeah, you're right. And <laughs> Ambassador Delenn is indisposed at the moment. Perhaps you would come back later. Much later. Yeah, he his background is interesting because he's the opposite of Sinclair. The Minbari hate him. He destroyed a Minbari uh, ship, one of their their flagship. He's and unwelcomed cruises. Yeah, he's unwelcomed by the alien community, but he's fully embraced by the uh, humanity, which is the opposite of Sinclair. Sinclair was welcomed by the alien community far more than Earth, and that's a great flip. But I I, I really liked in this this episode that they touched upon and it was good to do this because it humanizes him his insecurities as a character because he's very competent he shows himself to be the smart guy who figures out the solution at the end of the day we talk about this with star trek discovery where michael burnham's the hero hero where they're clever and they're better than everybody else and that becomes boring because there's nothing else to it sinclair Sheridan, sorry, in this one, he has that tendency, but they keep throwing in all of these uh, failings and nuances and uh, weaknesses and insecurities of his character. I really like the conversation at the end where he questions if Sinclair was here. Would this have happened? Would these people have fired? Would they have died? And he has to have a Vonover to help him guide through that uh, anguish. And It works. It works as you, the audience, are questioning if this guy is going to be better than Sinclair as well. It works on that uh, level, but on on the basic uh, front of having your main character now be here and they're perfect. They're the guy who's killed him in Bari ship before. They're the president's number one man. Ivanova really likes him. You need to have some... Uh, failings and insecurities to him, or else he's just going to be generic, boring lead character like a Michael Burnham. Okay, can I pick up on a, a small detail that I want to discuss, which is that Sheridan is told by the big brass dude, General Haig, that gives exposition dumps, <laughs> that he was the previous president's first pick Mm -hmm. to sub in for Sinclair. Do you think that was the truth or do you think that's a lie? Um, I think it's a mixture of both. I think he's Clark's number one for sure because Clark is a Earth first weirdo. Well, we know Santiago wasn't an Earth first weirdo. I don't buy that it was Santiago's wishes. I uh I don't I don't think so either. I think that is one of those things we can interpret, but for the time being that's what we're being told, but I don't think so. I think it's Clark's number one yep. guy. Uh what do you think about his backstory though? Being the guy who killed 
in the Minbari War, the guy who successfully destroyed one of their ships. Yeah. I like it. I I really do, and I think that it brings an interesting level of tension that they don't just use for the Big Bang in this episode and then kind of forget about. Like, it lingers. It's always important. And I will really enjoy the way that they kind of play with that setup in this episode of, like, Maybe, maybe they're forgotten. And the Mindaris <laughs> are like, fuck him. No. And even he says that that's. Like, he's like, oh, Christ. wishful thinking. Mm. Like, he wishes that he could put the past behind him. It's a different slant, of course, because he's a winner. That's his character. He's a winner. He won that. Yeah, where and he has Sinclair this fought in the war. He was a loser. And was going to die. die. And then he didn't even get he didn't even get to die. Sinclair had that underdog quality that people were against him. And he had that underdog quality also because of his backstory with the war. Sheridan's a winner. But he's an underdog because the people he won against, who we are who are the antagonists in this episode hate him and they really really hate him and he's also a a troublesome figure because earth loves him and we know earth to be problematic we know them to be fascist in their leanings we know them to be xenophobic it makes you worried on behalf of sheridan and if he's going to get on the right side of things how is he going to be able to smooth out the rough edges here He's also a winner because he won this military conflict and it gives him this kind of cocky edge in which he knows best because he's defeated these people before. He's a successful military tactician. Mm. Sinclair wasn't. Sinclair was on the line. He fought, but he wasn't a tactician in that manner. He was a tactician when it came to diplomacy, when it came to backroom dealings. But Sheridan, he's a tactician in the real sense of it, of I know that they're going to do this. I know that they're going to do that. This doesn't match their th- MO. This, this, this. Do the damn job of Oliver. Yep. He is good like that, but it is a very, very stark difference. That's something to Sinclair appreciate. would not have solved that situation in the same way. Hands fucking down. No. Like, Sinclair likely would have had all of that information, but he would not have thought about it in that way. It would have been presented very differently. Yeah, like Sinclair still would have been able to resolve the situation, but the way that it runs its course is because Sheridan's there. It doesn't feel like it was a Sinclair episode that they changed. The names around, yeah, yeah. It's like it matters that it's Sheridan. It matters that we have the information that we do and it's at this stage and that all of these things are happening. And it's reassuring to me that that's the case because yeah. it's it's not like the show has fallen apart without Sinclair. It's not that the writing is failing or it feels haphazard. The show still feels strong. And the things that I like about the show are still here. So even from like that first watch, I did trust that I would come to like Sinclair. Sharon. 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 <laughs> You you can't. We're going to be like that for a little while, people. The ser- that's the problem with you name your characters Jeffrey Sinclair and John Sheridan. We get it, JMS. You want to be in the show. We get it. We get it. Uh, author insert here. Fair enough. But you're gonna. It fucks with us talking about it for the first few episodes. JMS written episodes. Oh yeah, the first like three or four are. Yeah. I also think it's good that uh, we see his thinking in this episode because. It is the episode, the plot exists, right? The plot is evil Minbari uh, itching for war. It's well done. The pacing's good. It's focusing on that. But that's a structural point 
for what is the real purpose of the episode, which initially failed for you, which is letting us know who Sheridan is, what he's about, whether it's his actual details of his history, but more importantly, what's his ideology, what's his uh, uh, attitudes, what's his characteristics, what's his type of what's that. his type of leadership, what's his type of thinking, and that's very important here because, well, as we say, Sinclair would have dealt with it differently. They talk about yeah. that, but to see how Sheridan dealt with it, uh, obviously, it's going to test you on if you're going to be on board for his more traditional sci-fi sci-fi lead uh, approach to things and we're, we're early days but when i think of sheridan i think of him as the typical lead yeah and sinclair far more typical than sinclair and far more typical than sinclair and uh, that does have ne- negative connotations when i say far more typical but he is uh, as we say He's very well done, uh, Sheridan, anyway, in spite of all of that. I haven't had an orange in almost two years. I used to dream about them. Grapes, nectarines, plums, the black ones, not the red ones. I mean, it's amazing what two years on the rim can do to you. I have a hunch I'll be spending a lot of time in hydroponics. (laughs) New things are here. Let's talk about some of them. Obviously, we have some... Uh, new things like uh, Sheridan, as we've mentioned, Warren Keffer is here. I have nothing more to say about Studio him. Studio note the character. As we mm, network likely. note interference, the character. He's here. We can't have anything to say about him other than he appeared. We'll get to Keffer when he appears he more. He has a whinge. He has a little whinge. He has a holographic girlfriend. He's here. Uh, what did you think about the music? It was bold. At certain points, I liked it, and other points, I was like, this feels a bit too heavy. But overall, I thought it was good. What about you? I loved the music in this episode a lot, actually. There were some cheesy moments that I really loved the music playing during the scene in which Sheridan is getting absolutely fucking blasted into space by that one grey council member guy who is just fucking chewing his ass out for being the star killer man who's brought all of these issues here. The music, the direction, the the, the tension in that scene was truly palpable. I was so glad to see... So layered. I was so glad to see four words appear on the screen. Directed by Janet Greek. I was knew we were going to be in good hands when I saw that because she's a fantastic director for Babylon 5 and the perfect person to kick off the new season. She has a flair for direction. She is really good at shot compositions. Uh, overall, when we have an episode that's in her hands, the editing is tight. Uh, the, 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 the acting is really well done. Uh, some of the other changes, I really like the lighting. The lighting is far more vibrant. It's far more, uh, bright how and colorful. How far have come since the gathering? Oh, Richard Compton must be spewing about how they gave it good lighting. He's just like, oh, I wanted it to be bad lighting the whole time, guys. Ooh, you can see things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was great to see some spaceship battles. I really like the detail that the Trigati had a faded look to it because it's yeah. been in space for so long. It hasn't had a fresh coat of paint in a while, which was, <laughs> and it's an older ship. So I thought that was a neat detail. But we have to talk about the opening credits. What do you think of them? I accept the change. I I think that Sinclair's version of the monologue over the opening credits is my favourite. But I I like it overall. I'm like, yeah, I I appreciate that they change it each season and I enjoy the little alterations that they make along the way. Oh, wow. I'm so sorry. But this this, this season two opening credits, I hate it. Uh, It's my least favourite. Out of oh, the entire run of too. B5. I don't think Bruce Boxleitner has the chops to do the narration N- at the nah, top of it. Gravitas. He does has not have dropped. it. He has a good voice, don't get me wrong, but he sounds like a guy who is just talking. I don't yeah. really pay attention to what he's saying the same way I do with Michael O'Hare or with Claudia Christian or when we get all of them reading it for season four. 
I, I, I can't remember any of the lines other than the ones that were slightly similar to the ones in season one. I can't tell uh, yeah, you how I it goes. It it, it The song is, the music is, you know, it's fine. It's nothing too fl- flashy. It's not that different from season one's. Yeah. The actual images on the screen are, are perfectly fine. It's great to see a shadow ship cut and uh, a non ship in half. Of course, that's awesome. It's great to actually see the cast that are being listed in the opening credits. Uh, that's good. But it's that narration. It just is too similar from the first season's one, but with some of the words change around with one or two new things added to it. I wish it was f- much, much more unique. I wish it felt as if, okay, okay here's a great way to describe it. I know that they are discovering Sheridan's character, but mm-hmm. I wish that the monologue felt like it was from Sheridan. This feels as yeah. if it is uh, Sinclair left a, a draft of his speech yeah. and Sheridan just copied it down and thought that no one would notice. It does not feel right from Especially him. Especially when like the speech that he gives in the episode, like the good luck speech. Yeah. Is much better than the o- oh, opening yeah. credits one. Uh, I don't know where people rank their opening credits of B5, but this is my bottom one. It just leaves no impression upon me. It does not have wanderers. It does not have the a dream given form. It doesn't have the the Babylon project was a uh, uh, you know it failed. All of that. It's like it's the last one. It's here. People. The The Great War came upon us all. The end. I'm Sheridan. I'm here too now. If if it just lacks that oomph factor that it needs. This is the story of the last of the Babylon stations. The year is 2259. The name of the place is Babylon 5. This plot of the Trogadi being here, it's just there. So, one, we could have Sheridan be introduced easily with an antagonistic foe that ties to his past, but mainly so that we are fully aware that this is a Minbari-centric episode. And one of the big questions left at the end of the first season that they had to answer was what the fuck happened to Sinclair on the line? Why did they take him? Why did they surrender at the Battle of the Line when they were winning? That had to be answered. It was a hanging thread at the end of this first season. And they answer it here. Walk me through your process with this of what it was like when you first saw it and how do you feel about it now? How has it digested over the years? I remember feeling sorry that Lania got burdened with this dump, like the exposition dump that is that scene that he has to deliver. And I've grown to appreciate Lania in general more. And also in this scene, I was just like, he he's really trying to like balance it and give it a cadence to it that matches who Lanier is in his position at the moment. Yeah, Bill Moomy is so much more confident in this role. Yeah. I was also just distracted by the, the what? What? When having it explained, because like we know – that they have this idea of the soul. It's been set up. It's been set up. It's being paid off. And it will continue to be relevant. But I was just like, they're so advanced and they they think this. I keep saying I hate I hated lots of things, even though I went on this long diatribe about how happy I was that I got to watch this. I've talked about this before. When I heard the reason why they surrendered, the reason why they did all of this was they believe that human souls are in fact Minbari souls. I fucking lost it. I was so angry. I scoffed. I thought, this is stupid. What are you talking about? You're going to win a war and you just stopped because I believe our souls are in their body. Because Minbari don't kill Minbari. Minbari don't kill Minbari because that's what Valen has bestowed upon them. And later we find out Valen is fucking Sinclair. 
So Sinclair told them not to kill each other so they wouldn't kill humanity and when they were on the verge him. of winning and wouldn't kill him and everything ties into it. That's brilliant. But when I was watching it that first time and I'm sitting there going, what's the answer? That's, Fucking bullshit. That's the answer? That's aggravating. And it all ties up. Like, I understood Oh, they've set this up. Oh, that makes sense. But I had that classic thing of, oh, so every Minbari believes this because that's how TV shows work. Every Klingon is all about honor. Every Cardassian is all about backstabbing and lies and Romulans too. But, 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 but wait, 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 wait. I take it that way. I did. I did. I'm telling you, I did. And I, I just went, I know, and I just went, oh, I'm- they're going to do this trick where they're going to have. Lanier explain it and us human characters kind of shrug it off and going, uh, well, I don't, I don't believe that, but they believe that. And that was challenged, thankfully, when Naroon enters the picture later in this season, when he finds out why they surrendered and he reacts to it the way that I reacted to it, which is, you're telling me people believe this? This is fucking stupid. You're telling me we ended a winning war because some Minbari believe this? That's arrogantly dumb. I can't believe that we're, that we're fucking dictating our society, uh, through religious zealotry and fucking beliefs of prophecy. What? I thought we, like you said, Rachel, were an advanced race of people, but apparently we're, we're, we're following a coda written by a guy from a thousand years ago? That's nuts. Thankfully, that happened in the show. But when I saw it that first time, I rejected it. And as you said, this is clunkily done. Lanier just sits down and he goes, guys, it's time for homework. Have you got your pens and paper out? We're going to have to Excuse write a little me. essay about why season one makes sense now. It was very, it's still yeah. awkwardly handled. It's still very awkwardly handled. just wanted to say that I never believed that it was all in Bari mm-hmm. believe in this whole thing. I always, always thought of it when he says, we believe, it was the spiritual cast. Yeah, but then in the episode, they question of, oh, well, these warriors haven't been told about the soul. If they were told, then oh, maybe no, they wouldn't I be doing th- I this. I think that they know, they know about the idea. I don't think it's a secret idea, but I, I think all Mimbari know about this. I don't. And I... Because Naroon doesn't. No, Naroon, Naroon doesn't know... Why they quit the war. Why they quit the war. But I think he knows about the idea of the souls being generational. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm referring to. And I think that it's mainly the spiritual caste that believe in that idea of the generational souls. And that's partially why they're able to relinquish that and stop this Mm -hmm. as a holy war, which Linear also reminds us of. Yeah, yeah, I I understand that completely. But my experience with science fiction is, even though this uh, these people have been, their caste system exists, I just looked at it the typical way of, oh, they all think one way because that's convenient for the plot. And this episode minorly backed that up in some ways and minorly fought it in others. And I did not like this explanation. I did not believe in it. And thankfully, as the series goes along, they start to deconstruct it. They start to question it. They start to have an actual exploration of what that means. And that is why I like it now. But if this was the end of it, if this oh, was yeah. the, oh, we just believe you have souls. And then, oh, and then, that. and then everyone goes, oh, well, I guess they, they believe that. They believe that. And then, that would be it. Fuck it. But they don't do that. JMS is a guy who questions everything unpacks within his scripts. It. He unpacks it. He has people like Naroon doubt it and question the validity of it. That's what makes it work. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in this episode because it is just so out of left field. Why does Sheridan need to know this? Because we, the audience, need to know. That's the real explanation the for why... The council member told Lanier to do this. Why Lanier? Because he's one of the remaining cast members that can tell it, because Delenn's in a cocoon. Indisposed. And we can't wait that long for Delenn to do it, because it would be too long of a wait for the audience. It and wouldn't that's... make sense to have this in a couple of episodes' time. Yeah, and so we have to wipe the slate clean. We have to reset the board. That mystery's done now. Now let's get on board for everything else. It's always been awkward. 
And it's always been ham-fisted and shoved in there for me, even though I like it in the grand scheme of things of what the answer is. You like just what it does, not what it is. The execution's... What it becomes. The execution's sloppy. Yes. Lanier talking to the chrysalis out loud, saying to us, the <laughs> audience, that he told them the truth but not everything... It's it's hackneyed. It's very trite. Because we already it makes me rolls my got eyes. That point when um, when the Colleen the cat, and uh, yeah is like the Grey Council never tells everybody the whole truth. You got it. You like, got it. That was it. That's all you that needed. That was it. That That's was all fine. You needed. <laughs> Maybe some minor hints that Lanier's still and, uh, holding some stuff. Also, but- like the conversation the. The Grey Council guy has with Lanier, where it's just like, we told her that prophecy would attend to itself, that it would work out. Yeah. But then we have that extra heavy drop. And it's just like, what? You're burdening Lanier. Yeah, yeah. He no longer feels like <laughs> and a. I'm like, you deserve better, Lanier. He no longer feels like a character, but a dispenser of information. When you play yeah. a video game. <laughs> When you play a video game, you know how you can just press that button to skip through the dialogue options? Mm-hmm. That's what I felt like when he was talking. It was like, oh, cool, cool, cool. I'm mindlessly skimming through because it feels so artificial. It feels so detached. It feels as if I am just reading a Wikipedia entry yeah. rather than naturally being dispensed the information. Yeah. It is just, hello, I am Lenny and I'm sitting down now to give you this link. You know, you, wait, you know mm. it's going to be artificial when a character has to sit down to tell you because it's literally let's sit down and unpack the plot it has been our secret now it is yours it must be kept then why break the silence now i mean why tell us because changes are coming this episode can't just be a good episode it has to be a whole plethora of other things. It There's has to be a, a season of weight premiere. On it. it has to be a season premiere. It has to introduce new characters, new plot lines, new viewers to the show. It has to recap things. It has to set up these things. It can't afford the luxury of being just an episode where we can talk nitty gritty about the plot details because when you do, they're serviceable. They're done much better than they were in season one, but there's no real uh, surprisingly deep nuanced layers to nah. discuss. Like, we could talk about the Trigadi and the guy who kills himself and Kalein and uh, the Minbari... The blue poli- goo the, in the, the tea. The, the Minbari, the Minbari uh, politics and culture. We can talk about all that, but really, when you think of points of departure... It is a somewhat forgettable episode, but what it lives to breathe, like what it lives as, is all of those other yeah. facets of the production, of the nature of the beast, of being the introduction of this character, being a season premiere, introducing new viewers to this world, setting all of these things up, paying off all of these things. And that's what it is. Yeah, it's it, serviceable. It, it's not one that when we look back on this season, I'm going to instantly snap my fingers and go, oh, points of departure. That was a great episode. It is an episode that is here and it does its job very, very well. But that is the thing. It does its job rather yeah. than I was in a story. Yeah. That is my biggest issue with it is, I never felt as if I, like you, was bought in. All I felt was, oh, that's clever. That's clever. Oh, that's how they're going to do this thing. And oh, that's how they're doing that thing. And oh, they're setting up this thing. I never I never engaged with the actual plot or story happening. It was all about the overt mechanical things to get the rest of the season into gear. Yeah. But it isn't uh, a thrilling episode in the way that others will be. It's thrilling mm. in its minor ways of mm. Sheridan figuring out things is thrilling and of one of his quips, as we mentioned. And- I love the way that, like, everybody in CNC, like, you get this sense that everybody is doubting Sheridan when he's like, don't shoot. Because everybody's like, what? What the fuck? What the fuck are you doing? Like, you're in charge in this command order, but, like, what the fuck? I don't mm. want those people to die. Thank Ke- you very much. Not careful. Not careful. Oh. 
We don't want Kefir to die, guys. Not especially not in space. Getting shot at by an ancient foe. We don't want that. No. We no. all love Kefir. I hope he comes back. Ke- Can't wait to see him in the next episode. Kefi has a special place in our hearts. And and, and bowels. <laughs> You hear that, Kefma? You hear what you did to my wife? She's she's my wife, Kefma. You can't just break her on the pod like that. In front of everyone. It's not appropriate, Kefma. You've got a girlfriend of your own back home waiting for you. <sighs> it's getting so a man can't even enjoy a letter from home anymore. So, the actor that we have selected for this week's Spotlight is Richard Grove. So to explain the spotlight section, we are looking at an actor that appeared in an episode of Babylon 5 talking about their performance, what we've seen them in, any interesting trivia facts, so on and so forth. And as you said, we're looking at Richard Grove, who played... Cal... Kalane. 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 He played Kalane. Kalane. You know that he played Kalane because there was the Grey Council member guy played by Robin Sachs who said it a bunch. Kalane. Yes. Kalane. Kalane. Like, they said it too much, so I was just like, oh yeah, that person. Kalane. I just think of him as the captain. I think of him as the Minbari with the chin strap beard. Yeah. That too. That 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 is good. So I'm, I'm okay. going to touch base. Minbari beards. What do you think? You've like been pro beards before with Minbari. I'm I, anti beard. I'm pro beard still. <sighs> One day I'll change your mind by just re- reminding you that they have no body hair. That's the whole point of why Delen transforming is magical because she grows hair. Them having beards is weird. He has a good beard. So okay, fair enough. So tell it. us about Richard Grove. Okay, so you want to talk him about about him as a person first or his performance? Okay, let's talk about his performance. What do you think? I, I liked it. I love his performance. Okay. You good. know what I, I really love about- I wanted to make sure about- if we were going to be antagonistic before Mm-mm. I really dove into it. Mm-mm. But I really appreciate the th- type of- theatrical elements that he brings up and through that performance because it makes me really buy that he's managed to lead his crew through like over 10 years of exile and like just kind of being in space or hyperspace and just being like out there and fucking with shit and then they've gotten to this point where it's like what the we can't just keep going. Yeah. Because I do get that sense that, like, this was being planned for a long time. It, it's not just our, oh, Sheridan's there. This is, oh, we can do this and this and this and this. It's just like, no, this has been their exit strategy or an idea for an exit strategy for a while. And then Sheridan really gave them the oomph to go through with it. Yeah. And I really enjoy the way that he brings that gravitas and like that he has that posture mm. of I am taking up space. He's a big and guy. I am worthy of this space, both physically, metaphysically, mm. and intellectually. And he brings all of that with a dignity to it, mm. not a burden. I like how he stands out as a Minbari. Yeah. He's not Narun. I love his little, not- like, um, his little claws. claws. I like that he has a personality that stands out on its own. He's not Naroon. He's not the guy right. from the Grey Council. He's not like Delenn. A thing that I really note down about his performance is he is an actor playing a Minbari yeah. who's acting. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things I really love about him is he's got this off-kilter energy because he is pretending he's got a plan and he's playing it out. But the character 
is a non-committed actor. Yeah. So what I mean by that is when you watch a show like this, like, say, for instance, Infection, where we have the evil doctor played by <laughs> yeah. Ducky, and we know he's obviously evil. Mm-hmm. And it's From so the obvious. Star. And because his character is supposed to be playing to Franklin's uh, more sympathetic side, to us it's blatant. But it's weird that it isn't blatant to the characters in yeah. the show. Here, it is blatant to everybody because mm-hmm. he is not even trying, but he is minorly trying. The way that he waits for them to come get him, his line deliveries, it is a guy playing out his plan, but he's not a great actor, like the character. The character yeah. is non-committed to playing the bit in the fullest of ways. Because when we watch these shows... Star Trek, Babylon 5, Battlestar Galactica, Stargate. You have these antagonists where it's so blatant that they're pretending yeah. so that they have a plan. And usually the narrative goes in backward stretches to make sure that our main characters don't figure it out straight away. Here, Sheridan figures it out straight away, and I commend Richard yeah. Grove's performance within a performance here. He has this real blasé attitude yeah. of just... When he's talking to the Grey Council member, that's the real Colleen. Yeah. That's the real one. But when he's talking to Sheridan mm-hmm. and when he's talking to Lanier, it's him putting yeah. on a performance mm-hmm. so that way they can capture him and then he can kill himself. Oh, I I'll, love that. I love it. It's layers here. I adored his performance in the suicide scene Mm -hmm. because he doesn't have any dialogue. It's just like him being silent and the music, just a still close up. Like it's, it's Mm -hmm. not, it's not a very close up, close up, but it's not quite a mid shot. Yeah. Yeah. It's framed. So it's like him at the table and like getting that tooth out Mm. and the, he just commits it, to yeah, it. The, yeah, the 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 acceptance in like pardon the pun, but he's like, I, I just have to, I, I have to swallow this. I have mm-hmm. to suck it up. This is my plan. This is my plan. I'm following through on the plan. But like, as we he will lo- win. Like, looks at the liquid. You are reading his face and going like. He's resigned to yeah. this. And this it, is last it's option. Like the next level up because you get, you don't get that nuance, which I think that you could have with the second in command when she comes no. over the comms. Like you hear those ideas being echoed in what, what she's saying, but. Her as a performer, she's serviceable. Didn't bring it the, the way, way that Richard Grove did, yeah. and it's like it's very interesting to compare those two performances because Richard Grove is really fully inhabiting mm. that character, yeah, in a way that we love. We love seeing guest performers do that, and. We'll, even when it's just like we don't we don't agree with your decisions, but you had convictions, we appreciate it then. Yeah, but he hits it out of the park. We have supporters even among the council. They tell us that Sinclair is now on our world. He is an ambassador, so you say. But the Grey Council never tells anyone the whole truth, does it? Like he has as an actor, a background in theatre, and he's done a fair bit of Mm -hmm. sci-fi throughout his career, most of it after it because he was relatively new to screen acting. Um, So he was born in 1955 and had his first TV credit or credits, I should say, in 1990, because he exploded onto the screen. In 1990, he's credited in six different TV shows and one film. So he eventually moved into avant-garde theatre. Oh, I'd love to see him as Colleen doing (laughs) in-your-face avant-garde theatre. Um, I'd love to watch him in 448 Psychosis. I would love to see his fucking performance of that. Yeah. Where he plays everyone. It would be a lot. 
Um, he's currently more into voice acting and directing. He's in a number of Star Wars TV shows that are actually made for, like, the animation is made from video game machinimas. Yeah. Yeah, machinimas. Uh, he was in Army of Darkness as Duke Henry or the, the Red. The red Mm-hmm. Duke mm-hmm. Henry. He's, he's, that's a character. That's a memorable character. It's a that. movie that I haven't seen. The third Evil Dead movie. Very fun. Very fun. The connection with Army of Darkness to Babylon 5 is Patricia Tolman, who goes on to play Lita Alexander, or has already, mm-hmm. she's in that movie as the witch. So there's a little Babylon yeah. 5 connection there for you. And the other one that I haven't seen is Point Break. Oh, uh, Point Break with Keanu, Keanu mm-hmm. Reeves. Yeah, he's been in a plethora of things. Uh, I don't think he's been in Star Trek. Oh, uh, no. I he's been in Star, Star Wars, Wars and Quantum Leap, everybody. He was in Hurricane. Oh, of Quantum Leap? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, yes. I uh, would also like to mention... There are a few interesting other B5 connections, Mm -hmm. unless there's anything else you've seen him in. Oh, there is, but I want to save that. I want to save that because I I love it. I love it. So he was in the uh, Superman and Lois, or Lois and Superman series, which I do believe has Tracy Scoggins in it uh Scoggins Scoggins uh who will be commi- who will be Captain Lockley I'll have to ask our Canadian guests Nick and Pat about that I know they're big fans of that show they can correct me or let me know uh so hit us up he was also in Space Rangers a little sci-fi show which uh, I do believe one of the lead actors in that show is the actress mm-hmm. of number 1 in Babylon 5 yep. so that's an interesting little thing but uh, of nice. course Nice crossover. Of course, uh, Army of Darkness, but he was in an episode of Jake and the Fat Man. Yeah. Which I knew that name being important to B5 because we listened to the uh, JMS autobiography and he mentioned his experience writing for that show and what a wild time. (laughs) And I saw that and I said... Oh, it has to be in JMS written episode. We know at this point a lot of these actors mm. are people that JMS has had has in his out. Like I like you, <laughs> yeah. And it was yeah. it was a JMS written <laughs> episode of Jake and the Fat Man. And I'm not saying that's the sole reason for why he was cast here, but it definitely must be one of those reasons of JMS and the casting director and so on and so forth knew this guy from a previous project and said, "Hey, you'll be good here." Yep. Okay, so the one that I'm saving, and I don't know if anybody is going to find this as entertaining as I did, but since... Was he in Grey's Anatomy? No. No. So there there was a journey. There was a journey to uncovering the truth behind this credit. So I was like, oh, cool. He was an episode of Sabrina. Hmm. Sabrina the Teenage Witch, like the 90s show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, oh, who the fuck was he? And he's credited on IMDb as Mr. Grey. But oh, I want to know who he was. So I was like, oh, must be one of the teachers. No. No. Is he a witch? No. Satan? Well, he, he, he they remember that it's warlocks for nails. That's uh... why I, am. I, I, I knee jerked. He's a warlock. Right. Yes. So uh, I was just like, okay, okay, I need to find him. So I go to the Oh, Sabri- man, of course this guy's a warlock. Look at him. Did he have a beard? No, oh. I'm pretty sure he was clean shaven. <gasps> so, <laughs> so I go on to the wiki. And I'm like, I go to the episode because I love that new feature of IODB where you can just like click on it. Mm-hmm. It takes you to the exact one. So I knew the title of the episode. It's from season one. Oh, an early episode. Early. And I look through, I read through the summary, and there's no mention of Mr. Grey. Oh. And I was just like, if he has a name, he should be enough. No, ever He should not. be enough. So then mm. <laughs> I, got, I, I went the extra mile, right? And I went the extra mile. You watched the episode. No, no. So I, I, I did eventually find his clip. But... I then find the script for the episode, <gasps> oh, the transcript, better. and I search 
Mr. For, Grey. For Grey. Because originally, like, the I searched Mr. Grey on the wiki and it took me to Roland and I was just like, Roland know. is not played by Richard Grove. That's a dwarf. I don't know who Roland is. I haven't watched that show since I was, like, 11. Uh, he, he, I remember the time guy. I remember the yeah, time wizard do. man. Uh, Ro- Roland is... Like I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he is described as a dwarf in the show. Should we be a Sabrina rewatch <laughs> podcast? Um, maybe, maybe. Would but, Roland uh, have said yum yum? Yes. <laughs> um, he's in love with Sabrina. Oh, so he's Yye. Yeah, he's awesome. he's got he he's a horny little dude. Um, <laughs> and, and I, I, like because he had the word Mister and Gray in his wiki page, and I was uh, just like, no. No, this isn't right. So then I tracked down the transcript, search Mr. Grey, and then I get I, I, one of like my favourite scenes from season one. So you actually know the scene? I know this scene, and I'm pretty sure you do as well, because we've quoted this scene of Sabrina oh, no. at each other, because it's a Salem-centred scene. Oh, that's a good scene. It's a, it's a good one. Hit me with it. Mr. Gray is Salem's parole officer. <gasps> Fuck me sideways. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Was it worth the build-up, Brian? I give this episode least? a yum-yum now. <laughs> I was on the edge. I was like, oh, should I give a yum-yum because of all these reasons? But now, but do you remember? I do remember. I do. It's the like the first one where it's just like he's like oh. legit on parole. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, like he could maybe get out of being a cat, and it's just like three questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like any urinary tract issues. No, have you gotten any trouble? <laughs> no. Do you still want to take over the world? Yes. yes. No. 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 <laughs> I am in love with this actor even more so now. <laughs> I give this episode a yum yum. <laughs> what do you give it? I give it a yum yum overall. I was on the edge of giving it a yum, which is bad, <laughs> yum yum being good. But now that I've heard all this about Richard Grove, bam. In all seriousness, it's a yum for me, actually. Yeah. It's a yum for me, too. Yeah. It's serviceable. It does its job. For being an actual episode, it's just okay. For, but for all the character stuff, the, 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 the mechanics of what this needs to do for the rest of the season, it's great in that yeah. regard. But when I watch it... It does its best. It doesn't leave a big impression on me. It, do, it does its best, but it's weighed down too much for me to say that it's good. Could you please tell us what we'll be watching next time on Babylon 5? On the next Babylon 5. Revelations. Yes. How long will Malari's complicity in the the cataclysmic ruin of Quadrant 37 remain a secret? A while. (laughs) Meanwhile, Garibaldi has suspicions about Earth. Earth's Alliance's new leader, uh. and Delena emerges from her cocoon. Oh, I, I guess Garibaldi's awake now. Yeah, they don't. The know. description kind of ruins that. It's like, oh, and he's got suspicions. Oh, you mean he's alive and awake now? I wonder what happened there. Oh, and Delena emerges well, from her they, cocoon. They mentioned that the Garibaldi was investigating the plot. No, no, no. But in this episode, he's still unconscious. They don't. In this episode, they're all like, no. "Will he make it? But Will like, he not?" They, but they now, do but remi- now, but, but now they're like, "Hey, they remind you of it in this episode." DVD description. Just saying, JMS, you wrote a sloppy yeah. DVD description. There could have done a better job. You're the person I'm uh, blaming. When for I them. was reading that, I was like, "Did I copy the wrong one?" <laughs> well, but I'm I was like, "No." Delenn emerges from her cocoon next episode. Yeah. I'm certain that that's she, episode she, two. She has hair. 
So make sure people to tune in next week for that discussion. Make sure to watch that episode in the interim. You can find us on all of the social media platforms under Yum Yum Podcast or Yum Yum Pod. We are always posting things on there. We've got some very fun、uh, questions that we like to ask and follow up and discussions. We have videos, we have pictures, so on and so forth. You know the rigmarole of this part of the show where we plug our stuff all over. Over the place, we have a Patreon in which we talk about more things. We talk about the best and worst rated episodes of Star Trek. We our talk thoughts the- on general pieces of media, and currently、oh. for our movie-based show, we are working our way through the. X Men film. Oh, the X Mans! So come join us on the Patreon. We have a give us your Sabrina hot takes on our oh, Discord. Oh yes, you can be a part of a group Discord if you join our Patreon. We have the different tiers for different benefits. It is a wicked time. Make your voice known by also emailing us at yumyumpod at gmail dot com. Email us with your questions, queries, thoughts, concerns, and whatever. For else you feel, it is greatly appreciated too. If you rate and review us on whatever podcast hosting site you use, I hear that、uh, at the end of last year, start of this year,、uh, Spotify allows you to give a rating on it as well. So if you are listening to us on there, give us a rating there. And if you're listening on other ones, give us a rating and review if you can on those. It is very much something we would like. It makes me feel good. Yeah. Yum、That's... yums, please. We know,、mm-hmm. that much to Ryan's chagrin, that they haven't accepted that as the pure <sighs> rating system、I、on s- all of these podcast platforms.、Mm-hmm. And in general, like, when is Roger Ebert dot com gonna switch over to Yum Yum? Who needs thumb thumbs? I need Yum Yums. I sat down with the head of Spotify. I I won't name names. They know who they are. I sat down with them. And I said to them, "Bubbler, what are you doing? You're not giving us the rating system of Yum and Yum Yums. What's this star system? I've never heard of these stars. What is this? The new Scrubble?" And I got very upset with them. They were committed to the star rating system instead of the Yum Yums. So now they are forcing us to translate that for our listeners. Obviously, all listeners know that Yum Yum means good. That translates to five stars. Give us five stars or more if you can on your podcast host of choice. It will be、we、something that we you- love. We would we would love it. We, we give、happy. you. We give you. The max yum yum that we can provide. Yeah, please give us yum yum in return. I thought you were going to be more of we give you content, you owe us. Okay, no, we, you fucking owe us. No, no, we we, we try and give yum yum content and、mm. yum yum into the universe, and we would like some. Yeah, we 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 get yum yum in return. We won't overtly say that you owe us it. We'll just implicitly put it down that you owe us a good rating. But enough about ratings, Rachel. It is a pleasure to be back on Babylon Five. It is a pleasure to see all of these characters again, and great to be back in、yes. the room talking to you again, making you laugh,、okay. making myself giggle, and also just dissecting the material.、Mm-hmm. Good evening to you, Ryan. Ah,、uh, Jakar wasn't here to say it, but I'm here to say it to you back. Good eating to you, Rachel. Ah, Mr. Kelly.